Hey, quick warning, we're going to be talking a lot about the rise of fascism in Europe. Prada the company, Mucha Prada, and obviously me, none of us are pro-fascism in any way. Enjoy. Okay, Prada's work has been mostly misunderstood. There's a whole side of Mucha's collections that are never talked about, and we are finally going to blow the whole thing open today. Mucha Prada's first show, the very first collection that she created, was in Milan for fall 1988. And you immediately start to see the hallmarks that define the first era of Prada under Mucha. Strangely conservative dress, odes to uniform, menswear inspired clothing for women, and minimalist sharp tailoring. What I have learned from researching this video is that Mucha Prada's look is not based off of the things she likes. And for that matter, it is also much more than the re-edition Galliera, the crochet tote bag thing in the uh, symbol. And despite how cool it is that Raph is at Prada right now, I do think that the emphasis for today's episode should be elsewhere. So these are the things that we know about Mucha as a person. She has a doctorate in political science. She was an active member of the Italian Communist Party. She was also a active member of the Union of Italian Women, which is to say that she's a feminist. Most fashion sort of likes to operate as if politics do not exist. Sort of like fashion is, is such a a high and idealized thing that politics and all the other grimy, unfun parts of the world kind of don't apply over here. It sort of tries to shield you from politics. But Mucha liked politics. This is something that not only was interesting to her, but that she thought was very important. And she, I don't think, could work in anything without keeping politics front of mind. And today we're going to kind of look at how that ideology and her perspective sort of shaped that opening collection that she released and used it to uh, rather brilliantly bash the fash. You'll see it is means two things. Let's talk about what we know about this show. It was composed of 70 articles of clothing. A spokeswoman for the brand told WWD that it would be quote high priced and classical making use of the best fabrics and would also include knitwear. The reason she was emphasizing that is because Prada was known for small leather goods and so they really wanted to get the word out there that it's like we make clothes now. But you can see that bags really aren't prominent in this show. There's three looks that have them. They clearly are not the focus. So this is a collection of clothing from an accessories company. Also, it is going to drive me, I'm just going to say it now, it drove me insane watching this that there are people, this woman comes in late. She just walks in during the fashion show and sits down. If someone did this now, they would be shot. This is like someone jumping on stage from the audience during a quiet contemplative concert, accepting a FaceTime call and being like, oh, what's up? No, no, I can talk. And what that collection ends up looking like is, at first glance, just incredibly conservative, right? Meanwhile, in Milan, we're seeing Versace's work become more and more glamorous, more feminine, more revealing. There's tailoring here too, but the tone is very light, sexy, optimistic, ultra feminine, ultra aspirational. But then, I mean, if we look back at Prada, it may, maybe some of this is a little bit revealing, but no one would feel uncomfortable wearing this around their mother-in-law. So what are we looking at? We start with very masculine looks black and brown slacks, we have coats, we have these blazers, we have these cardigans, and here we can actually take a little bit of a left turn and start talking about class. This look kind of summons up this idea of a masculine Italian man, especially because of the hat, which is a Barretto or a Coppola. You may have seen these in movies and stuff, usually depicting like older Southern Italian men in their like morning stroll, like smoking a cigarette and like eating some kind of bread. Let me tell you something real quick. My wife and I both work, each of us, about 80 hours per week putting this stuff together, which we love doing. We have like the best job in the world. However, this takes a lot of resources and it takes a lot of time to create. So if you like this stuff, if it gives value to you, there's a couple of ways that you can support it. One, the best way is through the Patreon. You sign up, you give us a couple of bucks every month, you get some benefits, you get to be on the Discord, you get exclusive videos, it's awesome. The Patreon is the number one way of making sure that this content continues forever. The second way, make sure you're subscribed, hit the like, hit us with a comment on as many videos as you possibly can. The comments really do help us in the algorithm. And also, do a personal recommendation of the channel. Like, I posting us to your story is very sweet. I love it when people do that. But if you can, find somebody in your life who's like, 
this person really loves art or this person is really passionate about fashion or whatever and send them it and be like, hey, I think you would enjoy this video in particular. That is the most powerful way to make new fans. It's not to like repost stuff or to tweet about it. It really is to send it to one person with a personal recommendation. Please join my Patreon. Folks who are kind of familiar with Italy might be familiar with the class system that's sort of divided up between the north and the south of Italy. Mucha is from the north, which is considered the more like respectable and wealthy and more like industrious one. And people in the south of Italy, it's, it's very much a dichotomy kind of situation. So in this runway though, everybody is invited. You see people from many different walks of life represented in the same runway show that is all meant to communicate. This is very beautiful. This is an ideal. All this is very good and it all gets put up on the same plane. You see domestic workers. You can see housewives. You see military officers. You have the like the Sicilian dudes that are playing checkers outside. And this show is clearly inspired by the late, late 1940s and early 1950s, specifically in Italy, of course. And I guess that's most obvious in the length of skirts. Knee-length skirts ended up becoming a huge hallmark of Prada and the, the wardrobe for Miss Prada herself. But understanding this period of Italian history is going to be really important. So come with me to a time we're approaching the end of the Second World War and fascism has its hand all the way around the throat of Italy since Mussolini took power in 1922. Now, let me be clear. This is not a YouTuber using Prada as an excuse to make a neat little YouTube video about Italian history. We we have to talk about Italian history in order to understand the complex symbolism in this collection. There is no two ways around it. This is what must happen. Stay locked in with me. I promise it's worth it. Let's talk about fascism and Italy and class. Okay, Benito Mussolini brutal fascist dictator. He not only argued that inequality was a normal thing, but that inequality was necessary in order for Italy to be successful. He was a gargantuan asshole. Fascists essentially were saying, you have to work your shitty job and that your only identity is in proximity to the state. The, the, there is no individual person. Everyone's best interest is being represented by the state, even if for you, best interest means that you have a horrible job. This was called class cooperation. Operation. And as awesome as I guess that phrase sounds, it was terrible. It was an awful idea and no one liked it. We see already through the looks we've already mentioned that Mucha is taking high and low class elements of Italian society and integrating them into the world of her collection. And here in the first of many different times throughout this collection, Mucha is giving the finger to Mussolini and class cooperation as a concept. While the, the scope is clearly different, Mucha is incorporating a more meaningful understanding of equality into her work than was ever found in fascist Italy, highlighting the beauty of the domestic worker or military uniforms. All, the, all these things are together in the same collection, each looking beautiful in their own way. This is honestly one of the more simple things that we can appreciate about runway shows overall. They can allow for people, places, and ideas that are heavily cast in the real world to be all elevated to the same level in the brief context of that show. Okay. Military uniforms. We're going to talk about it because while this is a reference to just working class Sicilian people, this hat is super important because you know who else wore hats like this? Fascists did. Oh, sh oh no, oh. Sh a fashion designer is using fascist imagery in their collection. This is so bad. And yeah, I mean, if a fashion designer was using imagery of like neo-Nazis or fascists just because it was like shocking and crazy, then that's a little morally dubious and also just kind of lazy. That is not what's happening in this Prada collection. This is really interesting, subtle, nuanced stuff. This look is a visual double entendre. The all-black uniform was a crucial look of Mussolini's paramilitary group, which was aptly named the Black Shirts. A hallmark of their uniform, the Black Fez, was worn among higher-ranked members, and members of the fascist youth and women's troops wore black hats too. The combination of a black shirt, a black tie, and a black uniform jacket for those who wore them was a crucial distinguishing feature of this part of the military, which hierarchically was most closely associated with Mussolini himself. And if you saw someone wearing those things coming towards you, it was never good news. And we know for a fact, I mean, it's really well documented that the first era of Mucha Prada's Prada is all about military uniforms. We know for a fact that Mucha was inspired by the black shirts and fascist military garb for years. I mean, we have fall 1990, we have spring 93, 
we have fall 1994, but Mucha doesn't actually do the first black men's shirt with a black tie until fall men's 1999. Despite the fact that many critics, including the god Susie Minkes, who I real life look up to and is one of my heroes, she described Mucha's work as fascist in nature, but the, the depth of this goes so much farther than one would expect. And what's more than that, this is a huge middle finger to fascism. Like saying that this is a pro-fascism collection is like saying that Jojo Rabbit is a pro-Nazi movie. It's just, that's not true. I don't want to get distracted. We have a lot to cover. Okay, so this. This is one of the most compelling looks in the entire show. And this is an Italian soldier wearing a uniform from the fascist era. And we notice something really specific about this uniform. We have a couple of pictures. There's small variations, but they're all the same uniform. This is built, the pattern of the pockets specifically on the chest, it has this certain machismo to it. It looks like someone with a huge built up chest. It looks like pectoral muscles, really. But on Mucha Prada's end of things, it's a very, very similar jacket, but it looks more like a representation of breasts in the pockets than of pecs. Mussolini, this, this type of stuff, as we'll see in more detail later, Mussolini would be screaming about this shit. He hated stuff like this. This is the level of nuance that we're gonna be working with here today. But we know from other looks in the show that when Prada talks about a uniform, they're not just talking about the military, but a whole host of working class jobs as well. And the uniform as a genre of clothing is naturally pretty close to working class people, which echoes the other main thing theme of this and other early Prada collections, which is Italian neorealist film. It's a genre of movies that focused on telling stories from working class people in post-war Italy, stories that were about poverty and questioning society. Neorealist film overall enabled filmmakers to finally turn to topics that they literally weren't allowed to talk about during the war under fascism. And in the wake of an economically tumultuous time for Italy, they were focused on a vehicle to tell what they deemed to be real stories. This crucially important era of Italian film came about during Mucha's childhood, and they featured characters who wore one-to-one -one looks that we see in this very collection, particularly from the movie Rome Open City. And the movie's costuming is mostly uniforms and, very importantly, super restrained. And that's that's really what Mucha is presenting here. It's a collection inspired by these sober uniform looks. Let's talk about what everyone's reacting to here a little bit. Mussolini essentially wanted to micromanage everybody, especially women. The best way to talk about dictators of yore is by making fun of them, so welcome to my favorite part of this video, the government control of fashion during the war in Italy. Buckle in, this shit is hilarious. In 1935, Mussolini Mussolini instituted the National Fashion Board to Italianize the dress of women. This meant forcing women to wear high heels. Femininity was the only option. Conservative clothing was awesome and cool now. This is super funny. Books and dictionaries were published to create alternative to French coined fashion words. So it's, it's no longer haute couture. Now it is alta moda. Just in case you fell asleep, what I just said is that a room full of old straight white guys got together in a room to decide what was going to be pretty. It was Milan Fashion Week creatively directed by this guy. You may be thinking, that sounds like it would look like shit. Well, it did. Okay, but we do have to get serious here for a second because the reason why the Italian government was instituting all of these changes is really important. Four years before the start of World War II, Mussolini decided to invade Ethiopia just because they felt like it. Doing this made it where every other country in Europe stopped trading with Italy. So that means that there was no more selling of goods abroad, which meant everyone is now poor, and they could not bring in goods that they needed, things like clothing and food. So if you're a regular Italian person that just needs a new shirt because their shirt has ripped into pieces, too bad, there just aren't shirts anymore. Like, is food three times as expensive? Fucking deal with it, there is no other option. But very crucially, this made Mussolini more popular with people because he took a bad situation, no trade, and he spun that to the people by saying, we don't need anybody. I was so brave to go invade Ethiopia and now Italy can truly stand on its own. We will be like great strong Italy nation. They already produced some textiles and they just said, we're gonna just start making all of the textiles. And they pushed to everyone this idea of buy Italian and do that proudly. And so everyone kind of bought it. And you know, when you're under a fascist dictatorship, you kind of don't have a choice but to buy it. It's kind of like saying like everyone in Pyongyang was super excited 
excited when Kim Jong-un held a parade. It's like, yeah, your ass better be excited. They were also pushing these like beauty standards through all these different magazines and all the fashion companies that were, by the way, only allowed to operate in Italy if they had Italian sounding names. So when he was instituting this government organization, Mussolini said that it was important to supply women with Italian clothing that conveyed the, quote, soft grace that she had been proud of for many years, but that for about 10 years she had decided to deny, end quote. What Mussolini is referring to here is this movement after World War I where women were dressing themselves in a way that made them feel comfortable and empowered. During World War I, all of the men were off fighting and a lot of the women took up jobs at home and kept things running. This instituted a lot of pride in Italian women because they felt very capable for the first time. And so a lot of them dressed in ways that were conducive to their new lifestyles. Similar things were happening in the United States and kind of all over the world. The new look that women were wearing in Italy because of this was called the machetta or the tomboy style. And what's really important and interesting about this is that this was not a look that was just dominant in young women, like cool, fashionable women who wanted to kind of wear the new thing. Everyone dressed like this. All of the women, if you had old ladies, you had like little girls, you had like cool, fashionable women, you had like middle-aged women, everyone dressed like this. So it was all of Italy, I mean, a lot of people were noticing that like, man, everybody dresses differently now and Mussolini hated that. So some of the hallmarks of this tomboy standard of beauty was shorter dresses, flat shoes. Uh, a lot of women had shorter hair. Uh, a lot of them were emphasizing this like slender body type, which was important. That sounds kind of weird. It's important because the opposite of that was being used to emphasize it's like women are here for birthing children for making great strong Italy. So a, a lot of you probably have noticed here that this look is directly influenced by the work of Coco Chanel in France, which was happening around that same time. And it's so so funny because the the whole deal about this is that they made it illegal they were like you can't start bringing things here from france anymore it has to be all italy all the time but what a lot of these companies did we have it on record that a lot of them just ordered patterns from france anyway snuck them into the country made the dresses and were like yes italy and they sold it just like that and none of the guys from the fashion board knew any different and they were just like yeah that dress looks great do you know how they were able to get away with that it's because none of these pasty motherfuckers knew dick about clothes <laughs> And if you ever get confused about which side here was the bad guys, just remember that the fascists were the ones that took a fashion magazine and put out a big old announcement that said that the perfect Italian woman is a five foot two inches in height and 132 pounds. Very specific. But we do need to talk about this. So like this is an example of an outfit that Mussolini would have just loved. So it, it nipped in at the waist to emphasize silhouette. It was very sober. They actually recommended this for weddings all over Italy during wartime. Like this was appropriate for just all occasions. This piece was designed by an Italian brand called La Merveilleuse, but they weren't allowed to be called La Merveilleuse because the government fashion police said they had to change the name to Luigi's Spicy Skirt Suit Emporium and a Warehouse. Okay, bring it back, bring it back, bring it back. This this really could have been, the La Merveilleuse one really could have been on the mood board for this original collection. It, it really does bear a striking resemblance to a number of these looks in Prada's first collection. What's interesting though is that a number of these looks are very colorful and Miss Prada specifically said that the bright colors were chosen because those are the colors that she wanted to wear as a child but wasn't allowed to. It's also worth noting that those skirts here are often much less flattering than the ones that Mussolini was going for. A lot of them are poofier, much more stylized, something that like a little girl would really, really love. And what you probably already know about Mucha is that she eventually developed a brand that was the embodiment of that young girl fantasy stylized desire that she had from her own childhood wardrobe. Mew Mew was her childhood nickname, of course, and also became the name of the brand that enabled her to express this other side of herself. But Mew Mew didn't exist until a few years later and so for now you can see how Mucha is trying to figure out how to balance her desire to include this part of herself in the main Prada brand. Okay, pause. Something we haven't touched on yet that is just such a beautiful, crisp detail. So you'll notice that most of the women in this collection are not wearing like big old stiletto heels. They are wearing flat, pretty clunky shoes. So if you zoom in really, really close, what do we see? A Vibram logo. These are Vibram soles. Vibram was an Italian company that started in 1937, which was in Mussolini's era. It would have fit perfectly into his buy Italian standard, but Prada is pointing out that Italianness is not really what Mussolini wanted. 
She's implying that the buy Italian decision was made in a way as to purposefully control 50% of its population by making them incapable of running. And then consider that this show was for the fall 1988 season, brogues and masculine footwear being presented as an option at a time when most designers honestly were making heavy use of stilettos. So these are Italian made shoes using Italian soles that still stubbornly will not conform to Mussolini's ideal of what women should have on their feet. Mwah, mama mia. Here is another example of an outfit that Mussolini would have absolutely loved. It's a more comfortable version of a skirt suit, but with a cardigan and large white shirt collars. So many looks in this collection can be seen as a more casual version of this vision. Again, complete with flat shoes. This is another look that Mussolini would have loved, and how many of this collection's looks are just slightly less flattering versions of this exact thing? We can clearly see here that Mucha is making the Mussolini ideal like just more ugly more casual, more rebellious, giving these looks the same tomboyish energy as women who were committed to the machietza look but weren't allowed to keep up with it. But it is important to note with me saying the word ugly that in this early era of Prada, we do have Mucha on record saying that she doesn't care about silhouettes that flatter. I don't think the like ugly chic thing was something that she was purposefully going for in this part of her career. And actually, interestingly, Mucha didn't even coin the term ugly chic. That was said in a review of her spring, the, the really famous one, the spring 96 collection. And Mucha wasn't very happy that they said that. Okay, so back to the Fashion Council of Italy. With that in place, he also wanted to reach rural women and emphasize this idea of just being a homemaker, motherhood, this kind of thing. Basically, Mussolini was encouraging them to return to this look that uh, translated into English is called ladies in the field. It was a look that included peasant blouses, billowing sleeves, lace-up bodices, square collared vests, and fuller skirts. This look for rural Italian women existed before the fascist era, but to the Fashion Council, it represented how working class women could embody an identity that would be favorable to the fascist regime. So this look that uh, is, you know, in, in many ways just kind of French, but this, this very, very Italian, super Italian look that Mussolini was championing was ultimately adopted from rural kind of like peasant clothes. They just kind of straightened up those lines a little bit, made it a little bit sharper. Many of the looks in the later half of this collection embody that rural look, especially the neckerchief in the authentic dress of the ladies in the field is cleaned up and presented by Prada as more modern than the rural style in V necklines and sleeves that emulate a scarf being wrapped around you. In this product collection so far, we're seeing details that were worn in the 20s when Mussolini came to power and hated the machetta look. We can see that in the flat shoes, right? And then we see the ideal Italianization of women with the establishment of the Italian Fashion Council in 1935, but flipped to be made less flattering and more comfortable, almost taking these fascist fashion hallmarks and presenting a surreal version of what it would look like if the fascist look was taken back to the 20s. But we do know for a fact that a large part of this show comes from the neo-realist Italian film movement, which took place in the 1950s, which is after World War II, so why is that even included here? Strangely, the 1950s are sort of what ties this entire collection together and makes it much tidier as a presentation. I think Prada was trying to speak to women who did remember dressing like a tomboy. And they definitely remember when fascism took over and they had to Italianize their way of dressing. And those same women were left a bit shell-shocked after the end of the war. I mean, it's, it's the 50s now. Mussolini's been dead for five years. Italy lost the war. And economic hardship has plagued every part of Italy as they struggle to rebuild. But what are you supposed to wear now that there's no one telling you what to wear? I think that's the core of Mucha's idea here. You'd keep wearing your skirt suit with some caution, but with comfortable shoes now that were big back before fascism. And I guess that it would normally be time to buy new shoes, but the economy is so bad that you just kind of make do with what you already have. You're under less conservative pressure. You can maybe unbutton your shirt once. You can wear your cardigan around your shoulders. It doesn't have to be all the way buttoned up perfectly. Honestly, Bliss, this just kind of sounds like a reach. I mean, you can't just like take a random part of Italian history and claim that this collection was inspired by it. Boy. If you do not think that a feminist woman with a PhD who runs a fashion company was not aware of the fascist stranglehold on her industry and what that meant for the people of Italy, 
I, I don't know how to help you. I, I think this is almost more of like an inside joke kind of between her and the other Italian women who are in the room that remember that period of history. Like, look at all these things. Isn't it crazy to see all of these things together in like one collection? Mussolini would have just lost his shit if he saw this. Isn't this great? Under a brand with an Italian name, using Italian materials and Italian manufacturing, Dr. Prada is undermining Mussolini's ideas 42 years after his death. She's undermining the class structure that he so fervently believed in, the military reverence that he so believed in, and I think most importantly for this collection, the idea of femininity that he believed in. Join the Patreon, please. Love you.